How's it going, everyone? My name is George, and today we're going to wrap up our series of Spider-Man movie reviews or live-action Spider-Man movie reviews with Spider-Man Far From Home. The movie that comes out before, that came out before No Way Home. This came out in 2019, and it's not just a sequel to Spider-Man Homecoming, but also a sequel to Avengers Infinity War and Avengers Endgame. And just to recap from those films after Homecoming, so Thanos wiped out half of humanity at the end of Infinity War, including Peter Parker. The Avengers brought them all back. Tony Stark sacrificed himself. And so Peter Parker is now in a new post-Endgame world where... Basically, him and his friends lost five years of their lives. They're the same age as they were back when the snap happened. Uh, Tony Stark's dead, so Peter's dealing with the death of Tony Stark. And he just wants to go on vacation. He needs a break from being Spider-Man. He wants to impress MJ, played by Zendaya. But Nick Fury, once again played by Samuel L. Jackson, basically recruits him to help take on these elemental monsters along with a new alleged hero, Mysterio, played by Jake Gyllenhaal. So this was one of my most anticipated movies of 2019. I was ex I'm a big Spider-Man fan, as you clearly should know by now. And they were incorporating the villain Mysterio, who I thought was long overdue to finally appear in a Spider-Man movie. And I was very curious to see how they're going to follow this up with Endgame. And I was not disappointed. I actually prefer this a lot more than Homecoming. I think this is actually a great movie. Uh, Tom Holland, once again, is brilliant in this role. I think he's better in this role than he was in Homecoming. You start to see the Parker look appearing more and more. Because he doesn't want doing Spider-Man duties while he's in Europe enjoying vacation with his friends. But he's forced into it. There's this guy, Brad, that's also trying to impress MJ, and it feels like Peter's having all these missed opportunities of trying to show MJ that he likes her. And, again, he's also finally dealing with the death of someone that he cares about. Now, in Homecoming, like I said in my review, Homecoming, Uncle Ben's death, I'm pretty sure, was referenced when he talks about how it impacted Aunt May, but Peter didn't really deal with any death in that film film he wasn't really dealing with it and here you see him dealing with Tony Stark's death because Tony Stark was a mentor to him and also now there's pressure on Peter Parker aka Spider-Man is he gonna be the next big hero to save the world when the next big Avengers level threat happens and these elementals you assume are these Avenger level threats now the villain of the film or I kind of spoiled it. This is a spoiler review, by the way. It is Mysterio played by Jake Gyllenhaal. And Jake Gyllenhaal is one of my favorite actors. I love him in the movie Nightcrawler. And Mysterio is one of my favorite Spider-Man villains. And he did not disappoint. The costume looks great. And I really like how like Jake Gyllenhaal shifts performances, basically, in this film. He starts off as this nice, likable hero that s says he's from another universe. You know, he's... Becoming friends with Peter Parker. He's a lot kinder to Peter Parker than Nick Fury. And I'm going to get to Nick Fury in just a minute. But then like once the turn happens when Peter really trusts Mysterio. He has that smile and it's like right away like I'm getting the vibes from Nightcrawler. And boom he turns out to be this narcissistic evil manipulating villain. And he does such a great job of taking this villain and making him one of the better MCU villains. To me, he's tied with Michael Keaton's Vulture as like being like the third best villain in a Spider-Man movie. It's kind of hard to determine who's better. But he's definitely one of the better MCU villains, in my opinion. Now, Samuel Jackson appears in his film Nick Fury. And that's another reason why I was excited for this movie. I was looking forward to seeing Holland's Spider-Man interact with... Uh, Jackson's Nick Fury and Nick Fury kind of feels out of character but he still does a great job with what he's given he's compared to Tony Stark who was like who didn't want Peter to like have that much pressure on him as being Spider-Man wanted him to still enjoy being a teenager Fury like pushes Peter to grow up right away to help stop these elementals he's like a lot more tougher and stricter so Obviously, that plays out as an interesting dynamic. As far as the rest of the cast goes, 
I'm glad they gave Zendaya a lot more to work with as Michelle Jones, a.k.a. MJ. Um, in Homecoming, I enjoyed the blunt humor that she gave, but I felt like there wasn't a lot to her character. In here, there's more character development, and Zendaya really comes into her own with this character. Uh, Jacob Batalon is also still funny and great as Ned, Pierce's friend. To me, the one performance that dropped off from the previous film Homecoming was Marissa Tomei's Aunt May. And I know she's been criticized the most in these movies, but I really liked what they did with her character in Homecoming. And when that big reveal happened at the end of Homecoming where she finds out that Peter is Spider-Man, I was very interested to see what they were going to do with how she reacted to him being Spider-Man, and she just seemed 100% cool with it. I would think she'd be a lot more concerned like, I'm sure she is, but, like, it's not played out well. In fact, it's she seems to be more on the comedic side of things in this movie. And there's really no heartfelt moments with Aunt May. In fact, the heartfelt moment of this movie is with Jon Favreau's Happy Hogan and Peter Parker on the plane when, they, when Peter opens up about how he really feels about Tony's death. And Happy pushes Peter to, well, helps motivate Peter to saving the world. I think John Favreau's Happy Hogan improved a lot more in this film from Homecoming. But yeah, I was kind of disappointed that they couldn't they didn't do more with Marissa Tomei's Aunt May. Now this film's mostly in Europe. So it's going to feel a little odd, but I like that they're trying new stuff with these Spider-Man movies. Now, I do wish because there were deleted scenes in this movie like Peter stopping these criminals in a restaurant uh, Peter selling toys to get money to buy a necklace for MJ. It's not that taking those scenes out made the movie worse, but they could have made the movie a lot better. I would have liked to have seen more like Spider-Man taking on criminals before he goes away on vacation. Peter selling stuff to save up on money. Because one of the criticisms that the MCU Spider-Man movies seem to have is that, oh, he's not portrayed as this poor kid. And I feel like that really could have shown that Peter's money situation is not good in these movies. I mean, that was articulated well in Civil War when Tony Stark mentions he seems like a dumpster diver. And I feel like that just could have showed that Peter Parker, despite being friends with Tony Stark and people close to Tony Stark, despite being an Avenger, he's still a poor kid. Now, the action really improves in this movie. I really, One of the things I had a problem with with Homecoming was that the action felt tamed and safe. Here, they take more risks with the action. I think they did a lot better job. I think the special effects work, especially with the elemental monsters, was a lot better. Uh, the final battle is a lot better as well. And the stakes feel higher. Now, I'm not dogpiling on Homecoming. I like that movie a lot. It's just, even though that was the first movie in the MCU Spider-Man movies, it's still the sixth live-action Spider-Man movie. And sometimes when you lower the stakes, it it's like a win-lose situation kind of thing. It's like on one hand, like it doesn't even take itself too seriously, but at the same time, we're kind of used to having these huge stakes in Spider-Man movies. And I like that they are pushing the stakes here because... Like I said, Mysterio turns out to be a bad guy. He wants to be this big hero in a post-Endgame world where Iron Man and Captain America, well, Steve Rogers at least, is no longer around. The other Avengers are scattered throughout the universe. Captain Marvel's off to who knows where. Thor's with the Guardians of the Galaxy. Hulk's arm is no good because he did the snap. So there's really no one else to like take over. And by basically faking these elemental monster attacks, he's trying to become the big hero. And eventually, it's going to come at a cost of life. He wants to be the big hero no matter who dies. Like, later on in the film, he's not going to hesitate to kill Peter's friends once, like, Peter's friends also find out that he's also a phony. So, it feels like the stakes are a lot higher in this movie than they were in Homecoming. Now, I know one plot line that gets criticized a lot with this movie is the Edith Glasses. So, Tony Stark left Edith Glasses to Peter Parker. And basically, these glasses have access to all the Stark stuff, these Stark drones. 
And people criticize it saying, why is Tony Stark entrusting this dangerous weapon or device that has access to dangerous weapons? And I, I understand that concern, but I feel like it plays into the responsibility theme of Spider-Man. Because with great power comes great responsibility to me isn't just with those powers. It's also the te technological powers that are given to you. And in this case... Tony Stark entrusting all these, this technology to Peter, it comes with great responsibility and we see him irresponsibly using that at one point when he's trying to just delete a picture that the guy Brad takes, but instead turns into this whole, we gotta worry about a missile hitting the school bus thing. Now to me, the real story issue I kind of have with Spider-Man Far From Home is Mysterio's motivations, while they're fine and good, why do we have to tie him into Tony Stark? Why do we have to have him be this disgruntled Tony Stark employee or Stark industry employee? So basically, he created that program that Tony Stark had in Captain America Civil War. And he was annoyed about it and Tony Stark let him off because he was too insane. To me, this reminded me too much of the Amazing Spider-Man movies, what's been going on with the MCU Spider-Man villains, where in the Amazing Spider-Man movies, the villains were either directly or indirectly created or connected to Oscorp. Like the Lizard, he was a scientist for Oscorp. Electro, he was, a, he was an electrician worker for Oscorp. Uh, Green Goblin, Harry was, was in charge of Oscorp after his father died. The Rhino, even though he was a criminal at the time, it was Oscorp technology that is the Rhino suit. So, with the MCU, Vulture held a grudge against Tony Stark because it was Tony Stark and the Defense Department that screwed over his savage com salvage company. In here, Mysterio Quentin Beck is a disgruntled Stark employee. And before, like, the post credit scene, it always kind of annoyed me that Nick Fury, who knows a lot, and he even mentions how, like, he missed out on five years and now doesn't know a lot, couldn't really pick up on Quentin Beck that quickly. Although, the post credit scene reveals that both Fury and Hill, Hill were not Fury and Hill. They were so... In reality... How they handled the motivations of Mysterio. Like I just would have preferred it if he was just someone that wanted to take advantage of a situation where there's no other Avengers. And he's going to become a hero at no cost. So literally I just don't think the Stark angle tying everything to Tony Stark. Like yeah you have the scientist from Iron Man. That Obadiah Stane yelled at and said, Tony Stark was able to build this in a cave with a box of scraps. By the way, that actor played the kid from A Christmas Story, the one that wanted the BB gun. But yeah, that was interesting to bring him back. But it was like all of a sudden you have all these people that he's like pointing out that were either connected to Tony Stark or knew about this or knew about that. And it's funny, but it kind of feels out of place. And... As far as the tone goes, once again, the score is very good in this movie, like Homecoming. And like Homecoming, this is still one of the most entertaining movies in the MCU. And the jokes still hold up. And I know, like I previously said, MCU movies get a lot of flack for being too jokey. But I think with the MCU jokes is sometimes in movies, they, they're funny the first time you watch them and maybe the second time. But after a while, the jokes start getting old. But in some of the movies, especially the Spider-Man MCU movies, they continue to be hilarious. So, I want to get back to the final fight because I really enjoyed the final fight. I, I like how Mysterio uses the Stark drones to help make the danger of the elementals look real. I think that was a smart way to do it. And I love, before I even continue with the final fight, I want to get to the Mysterio illusion scene. I love this scene. It feels like it came straight out of a comic book. The special effects were amazing. The final fight, 
basically Mysterio dies at the end. And I think that there's a theory going around that maybe he's still alive, maybe he's not. Is he the sixth villain in No Way Home? I don't think so, but I think he's alive. He's known for faking his death in the comics and in some of the TV shows. So, Mysterio's master plan turns out in the mid credit scene after Peter goes on a, sw on a web sw swing date with MJ and things start to look better for Peter Parker. Things start to get messy. So apparently they found a way to edit. Mysterio's team found a way to edit what happened during the battle with the elementals to make it look like Peter Parker killed Mysterio or Spider-Man killed him. And then we see J.K. Simmons come back as J. Jonah Jameson. And this is before we have all those casting announcements like Jamie Foxx is going to return as Electro for No Way Home. Alfred Molina, Willem Dafoe. Could Andrew and Toby possibly appear? This was way before all that. They bring back J.K. Simmons to play J. Jonah Jameson. And he is still brilliant and entertaining. Quick talking. And it, it kind of looks like more like an Infowars kind of thing. But yeah, it's played off very brilliantly. And then at the end... The way they do it is so smart. We're like, it looks like, is he going to, is Quentin Beck going to announce that Peter Parker is Spider-Man? And right when you think it's not going to be announced, it comes out and, and says, Spider-Man's real name is Peter Parker. And then they show Peter Parker's head and Spider-Man is about to drop an F-bomb. And it's like one of the best mid credit scenes in Spider-Man. Or in the MCU. Because Spider-Man 1, 2, and 3 didn't have mid credit scenes. Amazing Spider-Man 2 didn't. I remember when I saw Amazing Spider-Man 2 in theaters. They gave us like an X-Men Days of Future Past preview. But it's definitely one of the best mid credit scenes in the MCU. And it really plays into No Way Home. At least the beginning of No Way Home. If you saw the first clip of No Way Home online. It takes place right after that mid credit scene from Far From Home. And I'm very excited to see what they're going to do. And yeah, Far From Home had that perfect balance of light and dark moments. They raised the stakes higher. Um, the action was a lot better. I really like the suits as well. I like the, the shield suit and I like the new suit that Peter creates in the jet before he goes off and fights Mysterio one last time. Uh, the performances were great, although, like I said, I wish they did more with Aunt May in this film. And I wish they kept some of those deleted scenes, but all in all, I think this was better than Homecoming. It's kind of funny. Like, people would prefer Homecoming or F Far From Home, and I prefer Far From Home over Homecoming. It's kind of like the alien-aliens debate. Do you prefer alien or aliens? And kind of like that, I prefer aliens over alien. Even though most people would prefer Alien. But back to Spider-Man. I'm glad I finally got to cover all these movies. And for those of you who are wondering why I'm not going to cover it into Spider-Verse. I'm going to do that next year when Across the Spider-Verse comes out. But yeah, my final score for Spider-Man Far From Home is an A-. minus. Outside of a couple of plot things and wishing certain characters would handle better. I thought it was a great movie. And I have a blast with it. And I think it's a, f a fun epilogue to the Infinity Saga. Especially after the emotional roller coaster that was Infinity War and Endgame. So what would you guys think about Spider-Man Far From Home? Do you prefer it over Homecoming? Do you not? And I know for some people this is either their best Spider-Man movie or favorite Spider-Man movie. Or the worst or their least favorite Spider-Man movie. How does it rank? Comment below and let me know. And I want to thank you guys for watching. Please like and subscribe already if you haven't. Please share this with someone that loves Spider-Man. Especially Tom Holland's Spider-Man. And I hope to see you guys real soon. No Way Home is coming out real soon. I can't believe we're finally there. Take care everyone.